such specificity at certain places, it felt almost like um, like a quiet gratitude. And that's how it felt in me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we just did a witnessing practice, um, and I can share more later in the Q&A about what and why. Um, and I just want to say thank you for making space to witness and be with us. About Bosch's book, situated within the frameworks of critical race, queer theory, and Aphrodite's or ancestral reverence. Basha Joe's work attempts to unsettle the power, privilege, and aesthetic ethos assumed by members of dominant cultures. Performative illustration examined complex uh, realities of racialized gender, socioeconomic, and sexual orientation oppression, as well as recognized methods of resilience used to negotiate these hostile territories. As a result, the imaginings of a third space emerges, where the lived experiences of queer, brown, and black bodies, past, present, and future, are, are centralized, and creative forms of expression are not only consciously utilized as tools of existence and liberation, but also as sites of celebration and joy. Thank you. Um, and I always have this problem, I cannot read my handwriting. So, <laughs> you're doing great. Thank you. I stumble every now and then. Mario Weems is a growing, politicized, healing practitioner and movement creator. Mario believes our bodies carry the wisdom they need to guide personal and collective healing processes, as well as a deep resource for creative expression and liberation. In 2017, they co-founded Cultivate, Queer Healing Lab, a QT BIPOC, queer, trans, black, indigenous, personal color, centered healing justice space, an experimental embodiment practice lab based in the Boston area with Jonathan Madhushi. Cultivate received Finley Health Center's July, July, no, Judy Bradford Award in Grant in 2018. Also that year, Mario was invited to join the Unbound Bodies Collective, a QT BIPOC performance art and community building project. Unbound Bodies is one of the Boston Foundation's 2019 Five Arts Boston Awardees. As a black, queer, non-binary creative space maker, they have contributed to their communities through practices of building popular education, program development, and accountable organizational processes. Kamaria also works in the role of program coordinator for public art programs at the New England State Forest. It's not that exciting for me. Developing grant opportunity programs for creatives and cultural producers. Thank you once again. So we're going to the Q&A after the lecture. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Charles Wallace Thomas IV. <laughs> Charles is a third year student at Northeastern University studying economics and mathematics with a minor in psychology. At Northeastern, Charles is the director of Northeastern Students Against Institutional Discrimination, said, a coalition of student activists confronting institutional marginalization by empowering students to become better organizers through political education and direct action. As a philanthropic strategy advisor for the Columbus Foundation, Charles helps to align funding with the needs of the city's most marginalized communities. He also co-led the North Side Vitality Project at New Rules Benefit Corporation, studying North Minneapolis's economic ecology and residents' sense of economic agency and self-determination, and has worked as a research assistant at the Center for Economic Democracy. Charles currently serves as a fund associate with the Boston Jiva Project, which works to create a new community controlled economy in Boston. As the Eugene Fund Associate, he helps manage investor relations and communications supports investment research, and assists with community outreach initiatives. Thank you, Charles, and welcome. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Um, 
Oh, no. Is that better? No. No? Is that better? Yes. Yeah. We're going to see how this goes. Are we going to you can just oh, speak up a little. Okay, how about that? Yeah. Better. Better. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. A little higher, Charles. Might have to go to like. Can the guy make it louder? No. <laughs> Yellow letters. <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Better. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Great. Yay. Ooh, they're never not technical problems. So that's cool. Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening. That was a very thorough introduction. Thank you, Nia. I am incredibly excited to be here. Uh, tonight represents the beginning and the culmination of so much for me. It was two years ago, almost to the day that I attended my first Ujima Black Chess lecture as a bright eyed, bushy tailed freshman in college, figuring out or hoping to figure out you know, what my contribution would be to the city here in my time of leaving for to serve the places that serve you. Um, as a person, and so I'm very honored to be here. Um, on my last day as a fund associate at Ujima, in fact, um, here at our Boston Ujima project, Chuck Turner, hashtag Black Trust Lecture Series. Um, so I am also inspired and profoundly honored to be here because I'm in the presence of such inspiring artists, Shazo and Kamario Weems, um, but also because I can never really get over how exciting the work that Ujima is undertaking is. Um, I'm also honored to have been invited to be here because to be affiliated in any way with the legacy of Chuck Turner is to have been proximate to greatness, to have borne witness to immeasurable fortitude and commitment to a better present and future for Black people and all people in Boston. To draw any comparison, I think, between Chuck Turner and myself feels absurd, uh, but we do share journeys whose beginnings are not too dissimilar. Uh, he arrived from uh, in Boston, uh, from Cincinnati, to attend college, and after graduating, embarked on an extensive career as an activist, community organizer, and ultimately city councilor. He remains engaged to this day, serving as, among many other things, uh, a member of the Ujima Community Standards Committee. I, as Nia mentioned, came here from Columbus and am progressing uh, towards graduation, much to her dismay. She just told me many times to drop out and say, Ujima. But I am also here uh, hoping to uh, embody some of the tireless spirit that Chuck Turner has exhibited um, and, and committed to continuing to work to honor his legacy and word and deed. Uh, I also consider it amazing that we are gathered here now in this particular formation, in this context, um, having grown up in a community divested from and marginalized by esoteric and historical dynamics, I am intimately familiar with the challenges of living in impoverished spaces and aware of the urgent need to find solutions. The realities of these experiences are paralleled, however, by an immense cultural and spiritual wealth, a wealth which, when paired with tenacity and unburdened by systematic poverty, sprouts and sustains living, thriving communities. <coughs> and here we are, at the end of the Ma'afa, the 400th anniversary of the arrival of African slaves here in the Americas, celebrating the Black experience in experiencing the joy found in Ujima, our collective work and responsibility. When I was asked to present, I was honestly at a loss for what I could contribute to this community. Over the past year, I kind of threw myself into Ujima's work, and I feel like I'm still on a journey of self-exploration, constantly learning, working to hammer out my perspective in this great forge that is life. And as I often do, I return to James Baldwin, who is, as Farah Jasmine Griffith knows, a person who I have looked to over and over again in order to see myself enough to be myself enough in a difficult moment. In notes out of a native son, Baldwin asserts that truth is meant to imply a devotion to the human being, his freedom and his fulfillment, freedom which cannot be legislated, fulfillment which cannot be charted. This, he says, is the prime concern the frame of reference. Given that we still exist in a world where in subjugation and unnecessary suffering abound, I ask myself, how is it then that we are to live out this devotion? How is it that we are to address this prime concern? I believe that to take up this cause is to be committed to economic, political, and cultural change. That is to say that we must work to foster enabling rather than inhibiting economic infrastructure create access to and deepen democracy within our political structures, 
and to gender cultures of cooperation within our communities? Well enough. The question then becomes how, or in what order are we to work to accomplish these goals? It may be easy to see, on the surface at least, that each of these pieces is inextricably connected with the other. They are incredibly interdependent, but one, culture, determines our ability to effectively participate in enabling economic ecosystems, those which promote participation without the denial of our humanity, in fact, with its affirmation, and democracy. Without a culture which dignifies cooperation and collectivism, one which, as Cornell West notes, constantly affirms the humanity and dignity of others, we cannot hope to be in genuine relationships with each other. We cannot endeavor, as a matter of course, to lure the best out of each other. We cannot engage in economic and political relations which uphold the principles of social and political justice, which, as defined by Eric Owen Wright, who my friend will tell you I quote way too much, offers the premise that social justice is that all people should have broadly equal access to the necessary and material social needs to live flourishing lives, in a restricted sense, meaning having basic access to water, food, and shelter, and in a more expansive sense, having access to those things which will enable them to fulfill those things which make them feel like a person. Social justice is the ability to participate in meaningful decisions about things which affect their lives, as an individual having individual decision-making power over those decisions, and as a collective, or over decisions which affect people as a member of a collective to have collective decision-making power in that sense. This is social justice. To address Baldwin's prime concern, then, we must find ourselves ways to relate to each other that are radical, meaning that they affirm these conceptions of justice and enable us to realize together that which is referred to as an Afro-future. The Afro-future, like any future, is undefined, but it is gloriously so, because it requires that we, of that so-called displaced diasporic seed who involuntarily reach back to the motherland in our dreams who have been scattered so far from each other, alone determine what it will be. It is radical because it requires that the rules are rewritten, that we, today, emphasize the possibility of tomorrow. That we act today, that tomorrow we may finally realize that sweet feeling of freedom ascribed to the ancestral memories of the motherland. Adrienne Marie Brown affirms that it is the emphasis on a tomorrow that centers the dignity of that seed, particularly in the face of extinction, that marks the Afrofuturist. Now it is our work, she continues. And the exciting thing about this time is that we are learning to name ourselves, our distinctions and solidarities, our Afrofuturism. Developing enough of a common language that we can be that much more explicit about the real futures we are shaping into existence. This future, though, as you may have gathered from the theme of this talk, is dependent on our ability to be in relationship with ourselves such that we are self-integrated, such that we nourish one another, and before we explore what that means or how it looks, I think it's worth establishing for the purposes of our conversation a shared understanding of our present reality. And so I turn to, you guessed it, capitalism. <laughs> Easy, but perhaps not unjustified, is it to scapegoat capitalism and name it as the, the source of all the ills of societies. I say, though, that it's not unjustified because it pervades. Indeed, it was intentionally woven into the fabric of the historical and current world order. Capitalism, as a refresher, but I'm sure not many of us in this room need it, uh, can be understood to be a method of producing goods in a society where, in one class, the capitalists, owners of the means of production, that is, land, labor, and capital, understood to be factories and machines, employ a class of workers to turn inputs, like natural materials, into goods. Historically speaking, it emerged from Europe from the 16th through the 19th century, um, and its development was facilitated by a process called primitive accumulation. Now, Sylvia Federici, quoting Karl Marx, relays that capitalism could not have been developed without a prior concentration of capital and labor and that the divorcing of the workers from the means of production, the land to which they had been previously entitled in some way, or the fruits from which they had been previously entitled, is the originating source of capitalist wealth. Primitive accumulation, therefore, consists essentially of the expropriation of the land from the European peasantry first, and the foundation of the worker, who is then required to work for the capitalists to survive. <coughs> this was repeated, of course, with the colonialization of the Americas, and the use of slaves on the American continent beginning in 1619. It was only natural that economic arrangements 
in a capitalist way, serving to increase profit margins, were married with racial and sexual subjugation, and thus only served to benefit those with initial access to capital and perpetuate the differences and discrepancies in access to resources as time goes on. It's by design. This is also well exemplified by the history of the destruction of cooperative enterprises in America, particularly those in the South, notably in uh, Oklahoma, the, with the destruction of Black Wall Street, uh, with Jim Crow legislation, with the Red Line, and on and on. Contemporarily, though, there are some criticisms of capitalism that I believe we should all be aware of and that we may find useful in guiding our thinking on how we ought to relate to each other to create a better future. There are many criticisms, I should say, but those which I think are the most relevant to us are four outlined again by Eric Cohen Wright. And the first is that capitalist class relations perpetuate illimitable forms of human suffering. Capitalism inherently relies on the exploitation and maintenance of the vulnerability of workers because your boss will never pay you the full value of which you are producing because they need to make a profit. And capitalism does not control for negative social externalities, like pollution and factors, simply because it is cheaper to pay the fine for polluting than to stop. Wright argues that it is precisely because capitalism creates the potential to eliminate material deprivation, i.e. creating massive amounts of wealth, but it cannot itself fully actualize that potential, meaning distribute it, that it can be indicted for perpetuating illimitable forms of human suffering. It generates so much wealth, but there is no way that is inherent to capitalism to distribute it, nor is there an incentive to try or even acknowledge the humanity of the actors within the system. This is fundamentally unjust. Two, capitalism blocks the universalization, cap, sorry, capitalism blocks the universalization of conditions for expansive human flourishing. This second criticism of capitalism asserts that while capitalism may have significantly contributed to the enlarging the potential for human flourishing, especially through the enormous advances in human productivity that it has generated. Mm -hmm. And while it has certainly created conditions under which a segment of the population has access to the conditions to live flourishing lives, it nevertheless blocks the extension of those conditions to all people, even within developed capitalist countries, not to mention the rest of the world. Three issues, right, to note, right notes, are especially saving here. First, the large inequalities generated by capitalism in access to the material conditions for liberating and flourishing lives. Inequalities in access to interesting and challenging work, that is, work which allows people to be fulfilled within. And third, the destructive effects on the possibility of flourishing generated by hyper-competition. And it is this, this last piece, that underlines the third criticism. Capitalism corrodes community. And here, Wright argues, two considerations are especially important. First, the ways in which markets foster motivations antithetical to community. And second, the way capitalism generates inequalities that undermine broad social solidarity. Instead of a tendency towards ever wider solidarity among the mass of the capitalists, capitalism has generated ever narrower circles of niche solidarity among people with unequal, segmented opportunities in the market. Here, he is referring to the disincentivization of the, mark of the managerial class, for instance, those who have been given a somewhat larger slice of the pie, though they own it not, to work to increase access to wealth and the opportunity to flourish under capitalism. And he goes on, community is narrow and fractured both because of the inherent principles of greed and fear that drive competition and because of the structure of inequality which results from that competition. Finally, the fourth criticism of capitalism is that it reduces democracy, even the potential for democracy. This is because political power is more easily accessible and maintained by those with access to resources, and therefore it grants these individuals an inordinate amount of decision-making power. Capitalism denies collective decision-making power to the non-capitalist class on matters which affect them as members of the collective. In this way, it denies their prioritization of interests and investments for those without capital and empowers the threat of disinvestment, which we can use to our own benefit to the extent that we are able to control investment. But you can't effectively vote for your dollar in a meaningful way, or vote with your dollar, rather, in a meaningful way, if there is always some few with billions upon billions more than you. What I find most insidious about this reality, though, is that the greatest threat is not the structures that enable this in and of themselves, 
but that their pervasiveness indicates that capitalist ideology has conscripted not only our bodies in the past and presently, but also many of our minds and souls. There is hope, as this is no irreparable condition. And in seeking to answer how to ameliorate and liberate our bodies, hearts, and minds, let's turn to a quote from Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, I don't speak French, who reminds us that if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks to work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. The ships that we are seeking to build are those economic and political structures which allow for justice as we have previously defined. They are things like cooperative enterprises, participatory budgeting, free education, community or internet, energy and energy infrastructure, things like an economic bill of rights, free healthcare, economic democracy, and so much more. In order for us to live healthy lives, facilitated by these entities, we need not be conscripted to their mechanical development, but devoted to engendering relationships and orientations towards humanity and the living world, which requires structures like these to be sustained. After all, Baldwin thought, rightfully, that all theories are suspect, and that the finest principles may have to be modified, or may even be pulverized by the demands of life, and that one must find, therefore, one's own moral center, and move through the world, hoping that the center will guide one right. As an aside, though, it is worth noting that we've already built a lot of these ships, um, and they seem to be working, which is cool. Further proof that we all have the tools that we need. Take, for example, our very Ujima, which has just completed its first vote on a local business nominated by community members. Or, for example, Restore Open, which champions a vision of a people-powered economy and accountability, rather than a punishment-centered justice system. Restore Open shifts, the shifts resources away from prisons and punishment and moves them towards community reinvestment and restorative justice via job training programs, business incubation, and a neighborhood space dedicated toward restorative justice facilitation. Or let's take, for instance, the aforementioned concept of economic democracy, whose elements exist to varying degrees all throughout the world. Economic democracy, defined as a set of social, political, and economic conditions in which social power organized through the active participation and empowerment of ordinary people in civil and society exerts direct and indirect democratic control over the economy. These are again cooperatives, labor unions, and the Ujimas of the world. A team of researchers based in the United Kingdom recently found that countries which exhibit more aspects of economic democracy tended to have lower levels of in income inequality. And in replicating their research, I found that countries exhibiting higher levels of economic democracy tend to be happier as measured by the World Happiness Index. And that when an economic democracy index for each of the United States was created, exhibiting higher levels of economic democracy tend to, uh, states exhibiting higher levels of economic democracy tend to have lower levels of income inequality and higher levels of economic mobility. This is all great news, but let's think for a moment back to what makes these ships go. I argue that the wind in their sails moves as a manifestation of a collective spirit oriented towards a better future and comprised of those nourishing relationships mentioned before. So now, finally, let us turn our attention to those relationships. In examining the key elements of relationships that we ought to have with ourselves, each other, and the world, I hope to offer what could be considered a compass, useful for self-reflection and individual and collective orientation towards our relationships, especially as we're finishing out the year and hopefully coming up with some New Year's resolution. On the south, we start with the self because, as Adrian Marie, Adrian Marie Brown notes in Emergent Strategy, small is big. We must begin with ourselves because it is from ourselves that we enter the world. How we are present for our own lives determines how we show up in others. The two most salient orientations we must maintain in seeking to integrate ourselves are orientations towards courage and towards a radical imagination. Cornell West again writes that courage is an enabling virtue. And so we must have the courage, enabling us to dream wildly, to establish critiques and think critically, but also, crucially, to have an orientation towards yes. Brown offers that we are creating worlds we have never seen. We are whispering each other, whispering it to each other, cuddled in the dark, and we are screaming it at people who are so scared that if they that they dress themselves in war behavior, they turn and face us. But because of our ancestors, because of us, and because of the children we are raising, there will be a future without police and prison, without rape, without war, hunger, and violence, yes. 
There will be a future with abundance, a future with joy, a future wherein we are not denied the right to step into our collective and individual yeses, to say yes to those things which make us come alive, which is what the world so desperately needs. All that we can imagine can come into being, and we must have the courage to imagine. Courage and imagination. When relating to others, generally, as humans, we're social beings. And the social entities oriented towards a radical shift, hopefully, in how we relate to one another, we must embody all uh, what Bell Hooks refers to in her simple text, All About Love, as a love ethic, which presupposes that everyone has a right to be free, to live fully and well. Hook argues, Hooks argues that by living according to a love ethic, we can learn to value loyalty and a commitment to sustain bonds over material advancement. While careers and making money remain important agendas, they never take precedence over valuing, nurturing human life and well-being. It is clear, then, that when we choose to love, we choose to move against fear, against alienation and separation. The choice to love is a choice to connect and find ourselves in the other humans. To relearn love in this way, as the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nourishing one's own or another's spiritual growth, we must have an orientation towards collective education. Education being defined by West as the formation of attention, the cultivation of a compassionate soul, not psychological bondage. We have to listen to and adapt to one another to continue to make space for collective growth. We must disrupt the notion that we know and attenuate ourselves to the experiences of others and respond to them with love. Politically speaking, to be oriented towards an ethic of love and education is not to say that we cannot progress if we're not friends with everybody. Rather, it is to say that we are more able to engage in the contradictions, critiques, and struggles of birthing a new future when we acknowledge and affirm the dignity of humanity. Always. Speaking specifically to the multitudes of the Black experience, Tommy Shelby invites us to consider building political solidarity within the diaspora via pragmatic nationalism. Pragmatic nationalism is the political program of black solidarity uh, and group organization functions as a means to create greater freedom and social equality for black. He contrasts this with strong black nationalism, the political program of black solidarity involuntarily and, and involuntary separation under conditions of equality and self-determination as a worthwhile pursuit in and of itself during the component of the collective self-realization of blacks as a people. Shelby writes that Black Americans as a group are particularly concerned with removing obstacles to free and equal citizenship. Pragmatic nationalism also seeks to bring about the social conditions that would enable, enable self-realization. Pragmatic nationalism aims simply to remove the obstacles to individual autonomy caused by racial injustice. He says that whether Black individuals use this autonomy to work together to realize more communitarian values, such as preserving the cultural traditions of the group is up to them. The collective dimension of, self, of black self-determination, black group action that springs at least in part from solidarity, is simply a strategy for resisting, defending against, and overcoming racial oppression. Improving the group's position is one way of improving conditions for those individuals oppressed on account of their race. The freedom black ultimately seek, blacks ultimately seek though, he writes, is not group self-rule in a separate nation state or institutional autonomy within the United States, but freedom from racism, relief from the burdens of racial inequality and poverty, and greater political participation in a multiracial polity. What is collective then is not the fundamental end, but the struggle to achieve them. Blacks reserve the right to act independently and to define their own political agenda in order to defend themselves against unjust treatment and to help bring about a racially just society. I believe that Shelby's orientation towards a pragmatic nationalism is viable, and further allows us to engage in the project of building a new world in coalition with allies who, whose freedom is bound up with our own. So as it relates to others, courage, over oh, room for courage, radical imagination, love, and education so far as we've got. On our world, Relating to each other thusly, we may return to that project of building a better world. But we will find, I am sure, that those ships which we sail on will more easily become institutions. And what are institutions, but culture and values incarnate, which serve to reproduce those perspectives which inform their creation? 
we can more effectively create the necessary preconditions for us to thrive, to sail, to fly, less as a matter of unnecessary struggle, and more and more as a natural and even logical consequence of living in the communities that we have created for ourselves. To progress, we must experiment, and experiments fail, but we must reclaim the right to fail and learn and maintain compassion for ourselves and others when we stumble. It is within us to do this, I am sure, and it is crucial, critical, that we act, even imperfectly, for, like Fuller said, it is easier to act your way into new ways of thinking than to think your way into new ways of acting. We must remember that though we fail, like Tariq Trotter, better known as Black Thought, we must piece ourselves together, teach ourselves to never let one loss divorce our development because it is shameful to just fall back and complain that you fractured the laws of attraction again, focus on a more passionate plane, estimate a more accurate frame of time, a frame of mind attached to the same, no conception is a vacuum. In normal lawyers deep, but we are immensely powerful and undoubtedly capable. Thank you for listening to this. My offering for you as we enter a new decade, and I invite you to dream with me. And I'll see you on the other side. Thank you, Barry. Project. Um, we've extended his time with us as much as we could. Uh, he did a, was it a year or a semester? A semester of co op with us, and then uh, we finagled some work study. Um, but now that's it. <laughs> and I have actually tried to convince him to drop out. <laughs> and he will not. <laughs> So I would just like to, if everyone could just give him a standing go, just give him a standing go. He has been phenomenal, and we, we really will uh, miss him. Um, but we'll see, but it'll be different. Um, okay, so let's take it into our Q&A. Hello, okay. Uh, so my name is Sabrina, and my question is super broad, but um, what what's the work that we have to do? Like, what what do you think is like an important next step that you're taking or that we should be taking in this effort to sort of move toward a future that we all desire? <laughs> Thank you, Sabrina. So we try not to start off with softballs, but I'm going to start, but I'm just going to open by saying I'm one of many people up here who could speak into this. Um, so don't leave me hanging, OK? Um, first of all, thank you. That's an incredible question. Um, I think, and this is also coming from me and my work and what I care about, um, I think that we need to do some deep feeling into ourselves. I think um, it is really hard to be in radical relationship, to be in deep connection to be in a space even of experimentation without um, one, being able to feel yourself, um, and two, and what I mean by feel, feel yourself is um, 
internally be connected to this great expanse, this great universe that we each are given. And they're all different, which really blows my mind. Um, the deep internal and the deep root. So that's like all your people. Um, all the people who dreamed you here, you know, however you want to tell the, the story or connect. Um, and then feel into your longing. So what are you longing for? And what is that, what is that great multi multitude of futures, right? So your futurity. Um, and I think that that is a space of like real magic, like really, um, and takes time and it takes, um, um, it takes a lot of sitting in the unknown and it takes a lot of practice, like a lot and a lot of practice. It takes a lot of practice to be with people and be in the vulnerability of legit asking, you, uh, asking yourself how you're feeling and then possibly sharing that with somebody else. Um, but I think that's also where a lot of trust gets built, um, a lot of integrity, and um, I think a lot of spaciousness. Is that abstract enough for you? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna pass it on. Anybody? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, I think I agree totally with everything that you mentioned. And I think what that translates to for me is whenever I encounter a choice um, to do something or to consume something or to interact with something, I find myself more and more asking whether or not it brings me joy. I'm kind of like Marie Kondoing my life in a way. Um, but I feel like taking those steps to do things or only do the things when we have a choice uh, which bring us joy is radical because it's not what we are acculturated to do. You know, kids or students in university are told to study things which are going to make them get or help them get a great job after college. And to the extent that you can, I think it's kind of radical to step into, no, this is what I want to spend my time learning. This is what I'm going to learn. And trusting that as I do the work to build a better society, it'll all be OK because I'll be able to show up as myself. Teeny mic. Thank you both for sharing your thoughts. Um, I tend to avoid and resist prescriptions, um, so I'll begin there. I think what I can share with you um, and with you all is a practice of vulnerability and exploration um, and how much growth is possible when, when I allow myself to fail, to forget, to reimagine, to recenter, to reconnect to myself and others. I think that um, oftentimes we talk about the ways in which like epigenetics work, right? Like how we genetically have been passed down all of these traumas from those of us, those who have come before us. And along with that, I think we have also inherited all of this wisdom and all this magic and all this healing that we also have access to. And, and I think that if we can spend a little bit more time in the gray and the not only like the traumas that we all have and for generations, but also like what are those stories, what are those joys, what are those like recipes of conjuring, of transformation and of growth that we've all seen in small and immense ways. And then how can we continue that on uh, in our lives? And for those who come after us. Um, I think the piece that we <clears throat> tied a little bit back into this piece um, was us exploring like the fact that we are living ancestors and so like that has the capacity to 
transverse time and transverse this body and dream of different ways in which not only to be with ourselves and our ancestors, but with one another, with lots of love, lots of patience and compassion and vulnerability, because we're not always going to get it right. But if we allow each other the space to make mistakes and hold each other accountable to change our practices, this is the thing, these are the ways in which we can internally, small collectively, and larger collection, collections of people, communities of people can grow together uh, with courage and with passion in ways that nourish our beings, not just our bodies, not just our minds, but our food. I don't know if I answered your question at all. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure, make sure you say your name, Jordan. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my name is Jordan. Pronouns he, him, his. Uh, graduate student at Northeastern. Uh, and I work in human perception AI. And so I have a question kind of related to like, empathy and really just, I have a future presence, so I call it the visions of the future that I want to help and create within it seems so clear, and then at times there's like these gaps. And by the way, I apologize for being late and working well. So I admit, if you spoke on this, I apologize. But maybe speaking to experience of like having these dope grand visions that you're working towards, but then the gaps that you get there, and I don't know, not necessarily for yourself, because if you can see the end goal, then you're going to get there. But like helping people empathize with that vision when you're in a gap, because sometimes I feel like I get in gaps, and then I don't even know how to get myself out of that gap, let alone help somebody see the vision when I'm in there. So advice or comments or stories related to that. Who's got this one? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Great question. Um, I think that the problem of running into gaps um, is kind of why I, I, I try to frame my comments around using a compass. Um, when it's, it's great when there's like an end goal or an ideal that we're working towards, like personally or collectively. Um, but I find, or at least in the limited experience that I've had, I find that it's often somewhat easier or maybe even more compelling to convince people um, and myself of a set of ideas which outline how I want to move throughout the world and then kind of through that setting I set myself up to have sort of this ideal future or some version of an ideal which I have for myself or for the world to kind of precipitate uh, from that. Um, yeah. Thank you, and thank you for that. Yeah, the beginning, and thank you. Jordan? Yeah, hey. Um, so, uh, like, I know the feeling. I know the feeling of, like, it can be, like, stuckness, it can be darkness, it can be um, doubt, like, self-doubt. Um, and that's why I think it's really important for me to not only like have commitments for myself, like something that I'm like, really committed to, um, and it doesn't have to be a thing. Like sometimes we think there's like a fixed point on the horizon. It might be like a way of being in the world. Um, it could be uh, like a ha like how you want to be in relationship with other people or be in relationship to like your dreams, your goals. Like I don't know. You know? Um, but yeah, having a commitment and then like sharing it with my people. So, um, I think a lot of times in the way that we're taught, uh, to move through the world, we're supposed to 
value confidence and we're not supposed to value like doubt or moments of um, questions, like inner questioning. And um, yeah, confidence is great, but that's not like a, a that, that's not a constant state of being. Like no one has that ability. Um, and if you did, I'd really question you. Um, and because that's not like human, and it's not a human expectation to have for yourself. Um, but besides that, I think uh, what's important about sharing. Um, maybe how you want to orient yourself in the world or towards what you care about um, with your people is that they can remind you. And they can remind you when you're scared or you're sad or you're questioning or um, maybe that thing doesn't feel as compelling as it did like yesterday, <laughs> which is the other thing. And um, I think also, so invite your people into that thing. Um, that you trust and you feel like you can be vulnerable with, um, people who you feel like can hold and honor the thing. Um, and also, like, in a couple ways, have them check in on you, but also, like, maybe give yourself some space to drop that. Like, keep checking in with yourself, and maybe there's, like, a recurring question of, like, does this still feel right? You know, does this still feel current to me? Maybe that made sense like a year ago, 10 years ago, five minutes ago, but like I just know something else or I feel something else or maybe something walked in that I hadn't dreamt of yet, you know. Um, so I guess like that, that compassion you have for um, like the dream or the goal, maybe you should have that for yourself too. I'm not, okay, should is a strong word, but <laughs> try it. Try it. Very delicate. Um, I am a person who is trying to get more comfortable with the messiness of unknown. Um, unknowing the unknown. Um, and finding that to be, in moments, really frustrating, right? And really, like, kind of agonizing. And, you know, I can get into moments of, like, really deep self-cannibalization. And those can be really, like, generative moments where I get to reorient, where I get to dream another dream that is connected to that without this particular pause or this particular moment of unknowing, I wasn't able to clearly like vision um, like a clearer path, you know? Um, and <clears throat> really like trying in practice to do praxis, right? Like I'll have an idea, we'll have like whatever it is, I'll try something. I might often will fail. <laughs> I'll try something else. Um, it might get me a little bit closer, right? I'll reflect on like how how are these things related to what are the things that are meaningful to me? Like what is rooting me rooted me to this to this planet, to this body, to um, to the things that nourish me, and let those things kind of be the guide and, and share, like, kind of going back to not everyone can be confident, not everyone has all the answers. And, you know, a forest isn't made of only one tree and using the people that I have around me and inviting them in into the process uh, in the moments of unknown and sharing that we can all be in that kind of messy unknown together and dream, like really come up with some really creative solutions that I couldn't possibly do by myself. Um, but that takes like so, like a lot of vulnerability, right? Like a lot of like, I don't have my shit together. <laughs> um, and that, I think especially, I don't know about y'all, but like that was something that we couldn't admit in my family. Like you always had to like have face and have a direction and have, you know, 
whoop, 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 like, go, go, go. And, you know, that's totally not me. And just being like, all right, well, uh, let me sit. Let me sit with this discomfort. Let me, like, you know, see what, what it's bringing up. And, um, and use those things as lessons as far as, like, how do I get back on the path or change, like, get, get the machete out to make a new path. Rashida Phillips also have written many books. I'm huge fans and friends of them as well. I support them on tour and going to their study halls and workshops as well too in Philadelphia. Um, and they do things in New York and across the globe actually. Um, so I, I really wanted to come and hear you guys speak um, and say thank you for having this space held here in Boston as well. It's been absent and um, it's been deeply felt. Um, I myself have been saying like, you know, I think this year, I, I'm doing so much already, but I'm like, I think this year I just have to get like a Black Quantumism club going, Futurism club going here in Boston, and for us to be examining this from a scientific approach, because there is a Black woman named Kame, and she did have a theory, and it was rejected by scientists um, in academic academia. However, a, a white scientist came up with the same theory, and his name is being published in books. So when we talk about radical, um, perspectives in the futurism through Afrofuturism threat on lens, there's also the constant erasure of ourselves to this day. Um, and these discussions and how they have the powerful ripple effects in the community um, and how they're not being named, names are not being spoken, which is why I like, am very clear on the names that I'm speaking on today because uh, one of the things that you guys are actually saying is like, you know, I am a walking ancestor, right? And like, I was really listening to you guys speak and um, when you acknowledge like you're a walking ancestor, um, how do you want people to carry your names, right? How, if, if people are not saying your names now with a loving tongue, how will it be spoken of? Because time is not a, a, a line, it's not a linear line. Time runs concurrently, the past, present, future runs concurrently. So the way I speak of your name now is the same way it will be spoken of in the future, it's the same way it will be spoken of in the past. Um, with a loving tongue, you know? And so these are the things that I think, like, when I think of, like, radical perspectives, I also think of, like, decolonization and the process of it and how they're, um, like, a juxtaposition against each other. And so uh, my question to you is, like, your decentering practices, like, your centering practice. Uh, what do you, if you could share with us some of your centering practices? Because I think, like, doing the work, I work in the cannabis space, um, it has been a war on drugs, obviously. Um, fighting legislation. Um, I'm, I actually was very much involved in getting Cam Cambridge passed so that only social equity applicants can apply um, in the city of Cambridge for a license um, to dispense cannabis recreationally. Um, these are things I believe that we have to speak up for um, and withhold and, and say, you know, this is our industry. This table has already been created. You're saying you're creating a table and that's nice. However, we already have a table fully built and you want to see at our table. That's what, that's that's my perspective on it, you know? And so there's constantly, constant, constant, a colonial perspective I run into on a daily basis. Like I just came from a meeting at the CCC. It was in a federal building downtown. They moved it all the way out to Worcester. Not even in a federal building, you guys. Like it was in UMass Medical, Amherst. People got lost trying to get there. The whole meeting got shut down today because a black woman here, resident here in Boston, her application has been upheld for over 610 days exactly. They still haven't processed it, but, and she's a social equity applicant. General applicant was processed within four months. 
She took counsel on how before they canceled the meeting and refused to listen to her, except for one woman, Shalene, Indian woman. She was the only one willing to sit and give counsel and listen. All the rest of them got up and walked out. So this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying I have to constantly center myself because I am dealing with a colonial mindset. And so there's a centering practice I constantly have to mind. Even going to a state house, going to the state house Tuesday, I had to go in there to record because I have to decimate information to make sure everybody, you guys all know what's going on. Do you see this shit that's going on, you know? See what they're doing? Even when you walk into the state house, seeing the pictures of slave masters, rapists, racists, being celebrated with their pictures on the wall as an assault and an attack on the black psyche and having to go into these buildings and have meetings, you already know whose house you're in with the golden roof. You see what I'm saying? You know, so if you could just share with us like some of your practices, you know, and stuff like that, I'd really appreciate that. My name is Saskia, but you call me Sauce. Who has this one? Thank you. Thank you for sharing about you and what you're passionate about and what you're concerned about with this group. Um, I have several centering practices. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, no, I know that. Not pretty much. Um, I think one of the things that when I know I'm going into hostile territories, I try to spiritually prepare myself um, with like uh, with a bath um, and those baths will have flowers will have like scents in it that mean something to me or that like enlivens my spirit um, and can have lots of things we can talk about particular ingredients um, as a way to kind of fortify my spirit so that when I go into those spaces i know that i'm not alone even though it may feel like physically that i am um another centering practice for me is um, trying to get out into nature uh, as often as i possibly can um, and bringing that like one of the reasons why that was kind of like the the sound bath that you all experienced through the performance is because that is a really magical place for me to remember like none of this really is real uh, um, and none of this is really where I want to put or focus or prioritize my energy but like the things that give me life are the things that are living and that are dirt and smells and sounds um, and so finding ways for me to do that um, as often as possible whether or not I can physically get there, or whether or not it's to like, track some file online. Um, <clears throat> I think if you have a, a place that is spiritually charged with your ancestors, is also a really good centering practice, and that that can change. Um, that is often a, a place in my house where I can kind of sit and hang out and I can talk to them and I can give them food and I can play cards with them and I can be mad at them, which I am right now, but that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and kind of like remember I think a part of I think a part of centering for me is remembering that all of, all of these different possibilities are happening, right? And you, you spoke about how time is not linear, and that all of these things are happening at the same time. And being able to kind of take a step out and to think about kind of the expansiveness of that, I find to be very grounding. Like some people, I really like. I want to like hone in. I think for me. Thinking expansively and generatively is really helpful for me to understand and situate myself amongst like the constellations of spirits, known and unknown, in body and outside the body. Um, yeah, I hope that helps. <clears throat> okay. Um, thank you for that 
question and thank you for sharing. Um, at sauce, hi. Um, I have um, a number of centric practices and I'm still um, curious and experimenting of like how I can bring them in more to my day to day and I'm like moment to moment. Like, as you said, it's like a constant, it's a, it's a constant, um, assault. assault. I mean, yeah, like, let's just, we can all like pull the words and the experiences of like what it is to live in white supremacist capitalism and the era of Trump and, well, impeach Trump. Um, but still, I mean, one person, huge system of white supremacy, right? Um, so, um, and like pushing the spaces of, cent of centering, I feel like it's also like some of my dopest weapons. Um, so um, from the outside in, I like, so I'm wearing this Octavia Butler shirt. Um, I feel like, I am a person who, if I wear something that reminds me of who I am, um, it reminds me like all the fucking dope ass like ancestors who were rooting for us, that really helps me like at least stay in this body. Um, and I'm also give myself a body to come back to if I need to bounce for a minute. <laughs> um, I also have um, a meditation practice, and um, me and Bashi were talking last night about uh, if we're going to be in radical relationship, in radical loving relationship with ourselves, like what are the things that we need in this moment to actually be here? And I said I needed to meditate, and so that's how I started the piece. Um, I, at my house, that's a place in my house where I regularly meditate, and I just have a feeling it has like so much charge it also um, allows me to like witness mornings and witness like ridiculous like birds of prey that go by our house like I don't even know like what that's about but I get blessed by seeing like hawks and like an eagle went by the other day it was wild I live in Medford y'all I live in West Medford okay um and then like Bashi said, visitation, like visiting the ocean, the edge, the water, the negative ions, yeah, 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 like going back to places that I know will just be with me where I am, but also maybe um, take away some of the things that aren't mine. Um, and last but not least, um, I had uh, this very question about um, centering and what we can do collectively to center together um, as a way of amplifying that power of centering. Um, so in our, in one of Cultivate's practice spaces, um, we don't do this anymore, um, at least for now, but we had weekly um, movement, we called it meditative movement. It was just like a bunch of different like um, modalities that we were all trained in and brought together to figure out like what do queer, trans, indigenous, black, and people of color need to like make healing possible? And one of the things that we landed in as a practice was to start and do all of our practices in our circle. And at the beginning of each practice, we each, not just me, not just John and me, like trying to decentralize the leadership and the ownership, not just the ownership, but the self-determination of your healing. Um, so we each speak into the space, like our name or pronoun, some healing question, um, but also like that check-in of how you're doing. Um, and then we each like get to witness how everyone's doing and not to change it, but to just be with it and to acknowledge that we're here. Um, and I'll stop there. I have a ton this moment, but I'll stop there. It's a really great question. Um, I. You know, I would acknowledge that I am so very much on my own journey figuring out what works for me and centering. So sometimes I'll do things and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. And then sort of by virtue of 
the institutions that I've been a part of, like the school, basically I'm conditioned to just go, go, go until things are done and then I kind of stall out and it's not, it's not great. But what happened, what, I, what works, what I find works um, is returning to things that I think it might have mentioned remind me of who I am um, and kind of what I, what I think I'm here to do. Uh, so one of those things is music. I play the trumpet. Um, and so uh, Roy Hargrove, who's a famous trumpeter, says if you take care of the music, it'll take care of you. Um, so I find myself returning to my instrument to practice, but also to just play and kind of noodle around so I can literally calm myself, but also remind myself that it's jazz, for lack of a better term, well, Black American music. Um, and we're still trying to figure things out. Um, and then I, in the, kind of in the same way, find myself reading things that I've read in the past that I saw myself in or saw something that I aligned with in. Um, and then also returning to like pieces of art that I've seen that have done the same. Um, and moving, moving around, so taking walks or, um, yeah. Shells or whatever those like little amulets are, um, and they punch you right and do different things. But you can be like, all right, when I know I'm going to go into these things, what are the things that give me the courage to do the things? Like, what is it? Like, what kind of pepper sauce do I need? What you know to like be able to be solid and present and fight for what I know and what is right, uh, especially in the midst of white supremacy. Um, and have all different ones. And like, those are things that you can always kind of return to and charge and recharge as you need. It's also just breathing. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. That's, so that's we like, need that. <laughs> we need that. That's how you can, like, get life. So I shared this thought with Nia, and she insisted that I need to share it myself. I told her to share it with you all, but she would not let me do that. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone on the stage is younger than me, and I came in late and I'm leaving early, but you all have left me with so many thoughts ping ponging through my mind, and I appreciate the brilliance that you all are sharing with the world. Like I go home and write things down so I can like chew on them before I forget them. So I just appreciate what y'all doing and keep doing it because it's wonderful. And thank you for giving me things to think about. space is, is all of us, right? And we all have this opportunity to share our experiences, share our stories, share our wisdom, share our passions, share our fears. And, and I, you know, I kind of wish that we had more time to, to be able to actually share the word. It wasn't like a Q&A where I'm supposed to like have an answer. I don't really have very many. Um, but I do have lots of fun. Right, I do have lots of experiences. Uh, I might be older than that person I thought, but I'm really flattered. <laughs> I'm younger than I am. <laughs> but I've also like experience has been one of one of my best and hardest teachers, right? And and I think that that's probably true for many of the people in this room. And being able to share those experiences and share those stories and those anecdotes and those and those failures, I'm, I'm gonna lean into like the failures because I often think that we overshare like all of our successes and we curate our life and curate like what we want people to think of us as these like whole beings. But 
I really would like to encourage you all to kind of like share the things that are not so pretty and are not like the things that you're proud of and, and have that be a way in which we can grow and learn and be together. Um, and I know that that shit is scary because we are not often in a place where we get an opportunity to do that unless it's like a close friend or family. Um, but back to kind of the question earlier, like what is it that will help us like move this ship that we're all on um, towards, you know, a world that isn't so anti-black and isn't transphobic and isn't like the seeds and the, and the, and the institution of <clears throat> and the culture of white supremacy is us being able to show up as we are um, in the messiness of, of as we are, with the failings of as we are, with the unknowns of who we are, um, and and be able to hold each other uh, with kindness and care and love as we all kind of like stumble through this this, this journey together. But that we can do that acknowledging again like we all have like collectively so much wisdom we have more opportunities to share that uh, in meaningful ways i think is a really powerful and radical moment um, and necessary so i am here because y'all are here Okay, I'll be brief. Um, so, I just want to share that, like, so me and Bashi are in this collective, um, and <laughs> if y'all just had a window into our meetings, like, <laughs> they are ridiculous. We're like, let's do this, let's do that, let's do everything. Like, literally, those are our meetings, and, um, what is so glorious and almost like, I don't know, I wish I remembered this more in our meetings, especially like the day before we have our performance, um, is that we never know what's gonna happen. Like we absolutely never know. Um, and usually the most like potent like yummy, gushy things are the spontaneous things that happen with the people who come. Um, and so I just want to share that I am in this like learning space of like how to create multi dimensions of like invitations in um, for us to have those like have these spontaneous moments um, and. Yeah, each time we get to do it, it's just like, it's just like awe and um, feels more like a gift to me. It's like, I don't know, maybe you got something to it, I don't know. But <laughs> I just, I feel like really grateful and I also feel um, like, yeah, I just hope that you know that that there's like a lot of gratitude for your presence. Um, and just last thing, this is supposed to be quick, um, is that uh, why witnessing was a practice that we, we chose to do and also um, something that is important to me is we did this practice for the first time in an art exhibition that, um, kind of exhibition's a weird word, but like an art show and community building event that, um, Unbound Bodies put together was um, to hold space for QT BIPOC folks um, to be surrounded by art and to witness each other and to give sustained um, loving attention to each other. Um, and so it was much like that. We just had one person move in the way that their body felt the need to express, um, and then the other person would just give them space and give them attention and feel into themselves as they were witnessing somebody else and then share what they saw. And the sharing was something about like 
what I noticed, what I felt, and not like prescribing a story onto it or telling someone what they did. Um, and we found that for like trans black people, that's really huge. That's actually like a big deal um, to have someone take you in and take you in with full attention and with like care um, and not try to erase your body or write over your body or project onto your body. One, for the person who was experiencing it. Two, for the person who got to witness we just noticed how little space we had to do that. To do that not just at home, even space to do it with ourselves in the mirror, but to sustain care and attention for ourselves. It's like, I mean, we just had this collective moment when we held the practice. We we're like, oh my God, why don't I do that with myself? <laughs> like, why don't I just witness myself? Why don't I just like watch myself in the mirror or, you know, um, and build our capacity to just be with each other. Um, so that was something that we wanted to share here um, and also just like dip back into like how much time and space are we making for our blackness in particular? How much time and space are we making for that like vastness of where, oh, Jordan's go. okay. Our, our homie Jordan who was talking about um, that doubt space, that blank space. What if we actually have space for that blank space and just, um, I don't know, approached it as like infinite possibility, infinite like space, like outer space. Um, yeah. That's all. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you all for being here. It's cold. Uh, we made it here. Uh, one thing that I've never felt as much as I felt over the past year, um, particularly within Ujima, is the notion of Ubuntu, which means I am because you are. Um, and that's been so, so real for me. So thank you all again. I look forward to seeing what we do in the future.